Bruce had the biggest heart of all people. She knows how to do it better than you. <laughs> Just the most easygoing, decent person you can ever meet. Bruce McArdle was adored by his family and friends and was a doting uncle. Talking bowls was pretty important to him because it was the only sport he could probably enjoy himself. Bruce suffered from a long-term cardiac condition. Bruce had it all his life and then he lived till he was 49. Although he worked part-time, Bruce was receiving a disability pension when he died last November. His heart just stopped. Hmm. He died about, it's about 3.30 in the morning and I was there with another friend of Bruce's, just holding his hand. Six months after Bruce died, his mother received an unexpected phone call. She asked me if I was Anastasia McArdle, and I said yes. And she said, I'd like to give you my condolences for the death of your son. And I said, thank you, but who are you? And that's when she said she was from the Department of Human Services. And I said, yes, well, what do you want? And she said, well, I'm ringing about Bruce and his Centrelink payments. Anastasia couldn't comprehend why Centrelink had contacted her. Well, it was basically along the lines of Bruce owed the money and she made out that I was responsible for those payments. She later received a letter from Centrelink. Enclosed was a debt notice addressed to Bruce. It said he owed Centrelink more than six and a half thousand dollars. The letter thanked Bruce for checking his past income information. I also wanted to know how they thought that Bruce would have worked his way through his paperwork when he actually was dead. Do you think Bruce could have owed any money? Bruce always was very careful with what he did with his Centrelink. Do you think there's something wrong with the system that mails debt letters out to people who have died? Yeah, definitely. No, they certainly have not done the right thing here. We're talking about a computer system. That's why they're called robo-debts. It's, it's a computer program which data matches with the Australian Tax Office. It's a computer program which sends out the letters. 7.30 has been inundated with stories from people who've received unexpected debts from Centrelink. We spoke to a woman who'd received Newstart who had a $4,500 debt wiped. A young woman with an intellectual disability who had an almost $3,000 debt waived when she challenged it. And an aged pensioner fighting a $6,000 Centrelink debt. These so-called debts, and I don't concede that they are legally enforceable debts, but if, the, if whatever they are, they arise as a result of the total incompetence of Centrelink. Sure, so what's the issue that you're having with Centrelink? Yeah, yeah. Sydney's Welfare Rights Centre has also been swamped with calls from people desperate for answers about robo-debts. Is that something that Centrelink asked for evidence of? She had no idea why she had a $14,000 debt. We're seeing more robo-debts come through every week. It's a nightmare of a system for most people to try and navigate. They're being encouraged to agree to what are potentially wildly inaccurate debts, if the debts exist at all. Tim Carlin has received government support payments since he was a child. He moved on to a full disability pension when he turned 18. He's a member of the ALP and works four days a week for a state government agency in Adelaide. I go into my local Centrelink office with my pay slips and just give it to the one of the workers behind the desk so they could process it to a computer. He's got epilepsy and an intellectual disability and oh, there's some medical issues as well. But really, he's rem he's been quite remarkable in the way he's handled all of that. Last month, Tim received a $3,000 debt notice from Centrelink. When I did get a letter, I just assumed it was an invoice and I put it aside. But then they sent a reminder out to my mum who then told me about it. Do you have any idea how that happened? No. 
No. I thought it was a mistake. And I thought just going down to Centrelink and talking to them would clear it up and it would sort of go away. Tim went to his local branch to try to get some answers. I didn't really give a reason. I think when I went in the first time, they just referred me to a compliance people on the phone. It's not good enough simply to keep telling Tim and myself that it exists. I want to know where the debt was, you know, what actually happened. What months did he underreport his income or what months was he overpaid? Not just to be told it exists. I don't really think that's a fair or equitable way to deal with anyone at any level. You can't just tell people they owe thousands of dollars without providing any actual proof. Leaked documents obtained by 7.30 reveal the pressure staff are under to finalise debts. Centrelink staff have been given a performance guide for raising debts that measures tasks down to the minute. Closing robo-debt cases is a critical performance measure. But what they seem to be doing is a cash grab. They're targeting a very vulnerable group who often don't have the ability to stand up to this kind of bullying. This is, this is just bullying very vulnerable people. In a statement, the Department of Human Services told 730 that it balances the specific sensitivities of working with people who have an existing vulnerability and its obligations to ensure that people have been paid the right amount. It said it regularly looks closely at sensitive cases to see what could have been done better. I just thought, well, here's an opportunity to be able to actually do something about the Human Services Department and the way they're treating people without any thought whatsoever for the people they're dealing with. You can read the full statement from the Department of Human Services online. The Minister responsible for government services is Stuart Robert. He joined me from Canberra a short time ago. Stuart Robert, thanks for joining us tonight. What, what's the point of sending debt notices to dead people's estates? What chances have their relatives got of tracking down what the matter's about? I mean, they may not even know where their relatives were employed. Laura, first of all, great to be with you. Uh, and you raise a particularly good question. Normally in matters where uh, someone has passed away, uh, if the debt is substantial, it gets raised with the estate, or an assessment is made as to whether it's economic to actually recover. And in many cases, the, uh, the, the debt is foregone and wiped. Uh, but the problem here is a more generic one about the robo-debt system, which is that people get assessments just saying, you owe us X thousand dollars. It doesn't tell you when that debt may have been uh, uh, raised or what it relates to. Can you understand why people are perplexed and a bit angry about this? I certainly understand that, Laura, and I always encourage people, if in doubt, contact the department. In the last four or five years, the department has recovered $1.9 billion in overpayments, and we have a legal responsibility to do that. So I guess it's it's type of a, a mutual obligation. People need to keep their affairs or their income assessments up to date, you know, using MyGov as one example, and of course we cross-check it with the ATO, and if there's a discrepancy, a discrepancy notice is raised. And that's the legal requirement we've got. Uh, and if citizens just keep their income up to date, and if there's any questions, contact the department, I think we can avoid many of these issues. But isn't there an inherent problem here? Tax office data is annual. People's income can be lumpy. It can only apply to some parts of the year. And this seems to be one of the reasons why when you compare it with income figures, it's, it's often wrong. Uh, and, and in the meantime, it might be six or seven years since these apparent debts were incurred. How many people keep those details for so long? which is why we encourage people to contact the department. Bank records, of course, are always available uh, for seven years uh, and the department won't be going back after seven years in terms of recovering that because there's no way for people uh, to actually have the records they need for it. But we'd simply encourage people, contact the department. On any discrepancy notice you receive, there'll be a phone number on it uh, or another way to contact the department. We'd really encourage Australians to do that. Well, one of the problems that people have is that they can't actually just go into a Centrelink office and talk about it with somebody. Why can't they do that? 
uh, they can. They can use an omni-channel approach, Laura. They can keep their details up to date using MyGov. Uh, they can use a telephony channel or they can go into a Centlink office uh, to have a discussion or provide documentation. But we're told that when you go into a Centrelink office, you are referred to the telephone services or the online service. If you're there to provide documentation, you can actually provide that documentation uh, to actually demonstrate the income you've earned. Uh, otherwise, you, there's a, a customer service officer there to speak to, or indeed they may refer you to either an online channel in the department or indeed to a phone service. Why can't the federal government uh, give, give more details about what the debt is. I mean, for example, you had to repay almost $38,000 worth of, uh, of uh, expenses from your home web service, and I'm sure that the Department of Finance would have outlined what it was that they felt had been uh, inappropriately or uh, mistakenly uh, charged by you. Why can't other taxpayers get some details of what it is they're supposed to have uh, incurred as an extra debt? Well, when a, when a discrepancy notice is sent out to people, uh, the first thing they'll receive is to say, hey, we believe there's a discrepancy, please contact us. And that's what we want people to do. We want them to actually contact the department so a sensible conversation can be had about what we believe the discrepancy is and ways that that can be ameliorated and solved. Don't you think there are essential problems, though, in the robo-debt system, Minister? I mean, for example, the fact that, uh, that income is measured uh, or assessed against uh, business names, not against ABN numbers. Would you concede that there are problems with the system that the government should be reviewing? Well, it's one of the reasons why we ask people to contact us. It, it is a, a difficult area because we're asking people to go back, in some cases, a number of years. But it's important, and there's a legal requirement upon us, to ensure that our highly targeted welfare system has the right people getting the right money at the right time. And that's why we look at, at past income, we check it against a tax return, we raise a deficiency or a, uh, a discrepancy, and then we encourage Australians to give us a call. And that's really my message this evening. If in doubt, call, contact the department. Are you spreading the, the net of robo-debt calls? The, our story tonight is uh, looking at uh, the possibility of people in, with DSP and aged pension debts also being brought into the net. There's been no change in terms of widening the, the uh, compliance program across income support measures. And uh, your brief in the new job uh, is to improve the experience of people dealing with the government. Do you really think that it's a satisfactory way for the government to behave? I mean, do you think that this can be improved? There's lots of ways we can improve service delivery across the Commonwealth, Laura, which is why the Prime Minister has given me the charter to work towards Services Australia and we're currently working through a planning process in that regard. We want a service for Australians that is simple, that's easy. If they go online, we want it to be, heaven, heaven forbid, delightful. That's where we want it to be. A real experience that Australians uh, can actually get the information they need quickly. Uh, can we improve it? Absolutely. Well, finally, uh, there's a lot of pressure building for a change in New Start and an increase to a, a more sustainable level for people on uh, income support. What's your personal position on the level of New Start? Laura, it's, it can be difficult getting by when you don't have a job. No question about it. It's why the Prime Minister has always made the point that the best form of welfare is a job. And we're going to do everything we can to ensure people have every opportunity to get a job. Thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Laura. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.